Well, hello, Belfast. Hello, Northern Ireland. You now know why it's so difficult to speak after Michelle she's better than me. But on behalf of both of us, thank you so much for this extraordinarily warm welcome. And I want to thank Hannah for introducing my wife. We had a chance to speak with Hannah backstage and she's an extraordinary young woman. Who I know is going to do even greater things in years to come. I want to thank two men, who I've hosted at the White House on many a ST. Patrick's Day, for their warm welcome First Minister. Peter Robinson and Deputy First Minister Martin McGuinness. I spend the whole year trying to unite Washington around things, and they come to visit on ST. Patrick's Day and they do it in a single afternoon. I want to thank the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland, Teresa Villers. To all the ministers in the audience, to Lord Mayor Merton Omuliwar. And I want to thank all the citizens of Belfast and Northern Ireland for your hospitality. As our daughters pointed out as we were driving in, I cause a big fuss wherever I go. So traffic and barricades and police officers, and it's all a big production. A lot of people are involved and I'm very, very grateful for accommodating us. The first time Michelle and I visited this island was about two years ago. We were honored to join tens of thousands on College Green in Dublin. We traveled to the little village of Moneygall, where As it turned out, 
My great 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 grandfather was born. And I actually identified this individual in this place only a few years ago. When I was first running for office in Chicago, I didn't know this, but I wish I had. When I was in Chicago, as I was campaigning, they'd look at my last name and they'd say. Oh, there's an Obama from the homeland running on the south side. So he must be Irish but I've never heard the Gaelic name, Barack but it pays to be Irish in Chicago. So while we were in Moneygall, I had a chance to meet my eighth cousin. Henry who's also known as Henry VIII. We knew he was my cousin because his ears flapped out just like mine. I leafed through the parish logs where the names of my ancestors are recorded. I even watched Michelle learn how to pull a proper pint of black. Audience member, Hoop. President Obama, who's cheering for that? So it was a magical visit. But the only problem was it was far too short. A volcano in Iceland forced us to leave before we could even spend the night. So we've been eager for a chance to return to the Emerald Isle ever since and this time. We brought our daughters, too. In particular, we wanted to come here, to Northern Ireland, a place of remarkable beauty and extraordinary history. Part of an island with which tens of millions of Americans share an eternal relationship. America's story, in part, began right outside the doors of this gleaming hall.
325 years ago, a ship set sail from the river Lagan for the Chesapeake Bay. Filled with men and women who dreamed of building a new life in a new land. They, followed by hundreds of thousands more, helped America write those early chapters. They helped us win our independence. They helped us draft our constitution. Soon after, America returned to Belfast, opening one of our very first consulates here in 1796. When George Washington was still president. Today, names familiar to many of you are etched on schools and courthouses and solemn. Memorials of war across the United States names like Wilson and Kelly, Campbell and O'Neill. So many of the qualities that we Americans hold dear we imported from this land perseverance. Faith, an unbending belief that we make our own destiny. And an unshakable dream that if we work hard and we live responsibly, something better lies just around the bend. So our histories are bound by blood and belief, by culture, and by commerce. And our futures are equally, inextricably linked. And that's why I've come to Belfast today to talk about the future we can build together. Your generation, a young generation, has come of age in a world with fewer walls. You've been educated in an era of instant information. You've been tempered by some very difficult times around the globe. And as I travel, what I've seen of young people like you around the world. They show me these currents have conspired to make you a generation possessed by both a clear-eyed realism, but also an optimistic idealism.
a generation keenly aware of the world as it is, but eager to forge the world as it should be. And when it comes to the future we share, that fills me with hope. Young people fill me with hope. Here, in Northern Ireland. This generation has known even more rapid change than many young people have seen around the world. And while you have unique challenges of your own, you also have unique reasons to be hopeful. For you are the first generation in this land to inherit more than just the hardened attitudes. And the bitter prejudices of the past. You're an inheritor of a just and hard earned peace. You now live in a thoroughly modern Northern Ireland. Of course, the recessions that spread through nearly every country in recent years have inflicted hardship here. Too, and there are communities that still endure real pain. But, day to day, life is changing throughout the North. There was a time people couldn't have imagined Northern. Ireland hosting a gathering of world leaders, as you are today. And I want to thank Chief Constable Matt Baggett for working to keep everyone safe this week. Northern Ireland is hosting the World Police and Fire Games. Later this year which Dame Mary Peters is helping to organize. Golf fans like me had to wait a long six decades for the Irish Open to return to the North last year. I am unhappy that I will not get a few rounds in while I'm here. I did meet Rory McIlroy last year and Rory offered to get my swing sorted. Which was a polite way of saying, Mr. President, you need help.
none of that would have been imaginable a generation ago. And Belfast is a different city. Once abandoned factories are rebuilt. Former industrial sites are reborn. Visitors come from all over to see an exhibit at the MAC, a play at the Lyric, a concert here at Waterfront Hall. Families crowd into pubs in the cathedral quarter to hear trad. Students lounge at cafes, asking each other, what's the crayic? So to paraphrase Seamus Heaney, it's the manifestation of sheer, bloody genius. This island is now chic. And these daily moments of life in a bustling city and a changing country. It may seem ordinary to many of you and that's what makes it so extraordinary. That's what your parents and grandparents dreamt for all of you to travel without the burden of checkpoints. or roadblocks, or seeing soldiers on patrol. To enjoy a sunny day free from the ever-present awareness that violence could blacken it at any moment. To befriend or fall in love with whomever you want. They hoped for a day when the world would think something different when they heard. The word Belfast. Because of their effort, because of their courage that day has come. Because of their work, those dreams they had for you became. The most incredible thing of all they became a reality. It's been 15 years now since the Good Friday Agreement, since clenched fists gave way to outstretched hands. The people of this island voted in overwhelming numbers to see beyond the scars of violence and mistrust. And to choose to wage peace.
Over the years, other breakthroughs and agreements have followed. That's extraordinary, because for years, Few conflicts in the world seemed more intractable than the one here in Northern Ireland. And when peace was achieved here, it gave the entire world hope. The world rejoiced in your achievement especially in America. Pubs from Chicago to Boston were scenes of revelry. Folks celebrating the hard work of Hume and Trimble and Adams and Paisley, and so many others. In America, you helped us transcend our differences because if there's one thing on which Democrats end, Republicans in America wholeheartedly agree, it's that we strongly support a peaceful and prosperous Northern Ireland. But as all of you know all too well, for all the strides that you've made, there's still much work to do. there are still people who haven't reaped the rewards of peace. There are those who aren't convinced that the effort is worth it. There are still wounds that haven't healed, and communities where tensions and mistrust hangs in the air. There are walls that still stand, there are still many miles to go. From the start, no one was naive enough to believe that peace would be anything but a long journey. Yates once wrote peace comes dropping slow. But that doesn't mean our efforts to forge a real and lasting peace should come dropping slow. This work is as urgent now as it has ever been, because there's more to lose now than there has ever been. In today's hyperconnected world, what happens here has an impact on lives far from these green shores. If you continue your courageous path toward a permanent peace, 
and all the social and economic benefits that have come with it? That won't just be good for you, it will be good for this entire island. It will be good for the United Kingdom. It will be good for Europe. It will be good for the world. <laughs>